certainly is good to see everyone out here. I always look forward to these. And, and uh, well, I tell you what, today's I was I've been praying for direction for for this uh, probably since January when we did the finish up the Parents of Faith uh, version of this. And so, um, and then the Lord started directing towards Psalm 119. And to be honest, when I when I began studying for this, I was going a different direction for the men of faith. Uh, and uh, I was I had three different things that were on my mind, and to be honest, there was just so much oh, yeah. here um, for the three different directions I was going to go with it that I could only go with one. And I don't even know if I'm even going to get done with the one in these three sections. There was so much here, which is also at the same time the Lord led me to uh, go ahead and, and uh, begin a series on Sunday nights covering Psalm 119. It really is amazing. Uh, let, matter of fact, let's go ahead and do a little bit of reading now. Let's open our Bibles up to Psalm 119. We're going to go to verse 25. Psalm 119, starting there in verse 25. It says, My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness, heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven. I do pray for your blessing upon the men of faith today. I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that you would be magnified. Lord, I, I pray that through all of this, all that is said and done today, Lord, that we would draw closer to you. Lord, that you, you would teach us these eight verses that we're going to be looking at right now. And Lord, how we can leave being cleave, cleaving our soul to the dust of this earth to running after you. So, Lord, I pray that you'd bless. You know exactly what needs to be said. You know the different struggles that are in here. You know what our church needs in the lives of our men. So, Lord, I pray that you would do work. I pray this would not be in vain. I pray it would change us. I pray it would help us. That it would be more than just good fellowship that we need. But, Lord, that you would quicken us. Again, Lord, I love you. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 119 is, is, is perhaps one of the most amazing chapters in the Word of God, if not the most amazing chapter in, in, in the entire Bible. Of course, as you probably know, it is the largest with 176 verses in it. It is broken into 22 sections of 8 verses each. And of course, each is associated with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's an acrostic is, is how it comes out. And uh, Spurgeon said this about this psalm, and his notes on the psalm are incredible. Um, on his uh, commentary in the book of Psalms. He had said that um, uh, we, we might do well, he said a lot of it, I'm just going to quote a small sentence over here, we might do well to commit it to memory, speaking of Psalm 119, which is what I would like to see us do, is actually commit Psalm 119 to memory, which is what you have in front of you. You have 22 cards broken into the eight verses each right there. You say, I couldn't do that. Sure you could. It's, it's really not that difficult to have this committed to memory, as you might think. You know, it, it's kind of like they, they have the expression, how do, you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's what you do. Amen. And, uh, and the cards, what you do is, are, these are Josiah's right here, the one that you're on, you just keep it with you. All right? You just keep it with you throughout the day. You, you don't set aside, you know, two hours where I'm going to be in the Bible memorizing for those set two hours. You keep it with you and you work on it each day, verse by verse. You, you could probably easily do four to five verses in one week, if not eight, because all the verses in Psalm 176 are short. Um, they're, they're a series of thoughts. You're going to find relationships between the first verse in each stanza and the fifth verse. You're going to notice different things. When I began to get into Psalm 19, it was a year ago when uh, Pastor Strange was here. He was here, and, 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 and he did his devotions in a different way in regards to his Bible as we were traveling. I was seeing him going to different things, so I'd asked him, I said, I said, how are you doing your devotions for your reading? And and he had told me the different things he did, and one of the things he did was he went through Psalm 119 every three days. And so I said, you know what, I'm incorporating that. So I've done that now a little over a year, and going through Psalm 119 every three days. It's basically just breaking it down to 60 verses each and going through it each and every day. And uh, um, which, again, I, I certainly highly recommend that. 
but I do think it is good to, it certainly is good to memorize it. There's a lot of amazing prayers that as I've just went through it without even purposing to memorize it, you're going to notice a lot of it is in the idea of a prayer, which I found those not, not by maybe a set conscious decision, but just by in the middle of praying or praying the same thing. You know, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not into covetousness. Um, and there's, there's, there's this verse after verse after verse that when I'd pray would come to mind. <clears throat> Psalm 119 it sits really right at the halfway point in the Word of God. It really is amazing. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. Psalm 119 is the 595th chapter. Psalm 118 would be your dead, uh, dead center, and then starting off again is Psalm 119. In the end, of all the 176 verses, it really varies on where you read. Some say one, some say three, and some say five verses that do not directly deal with with the Word of God. Now, the authorship of Psalm 119 is unknown. There are three names in the running, and I'm going to make my case for who I believe wrote Psalm 119. The three names in the running are David, Ezra, and Daniel. Many assume David because, after all, it's a psalm, and it does deal a lot with affliction, and David certainly went through a lot of affliction in his life, and, and I believe he is a very likely, if I get to heaven and the Lord says David wrote it, I, I'm not going to be surprised at all. I certainly can see a lot of Davidic elements in Psalm 119 as you go through it. Um, however, I do not believe it's David, nor do I believe it's Daniel. I think he's the unlikely of all three to read it. He would be the one I get to heaven, I'm going to be, oh. Daniel wrote that. I'll be surprised. But then that's going to happen to me a lot. I'm sure. Oh, really? I had no idea. So he might be the likely candidate. Um, but I lean strongly towards Ezra, uh, believing that Ezra wrote Psalm 119. And I'm going to try and make a little bit of a case for that uh, right now and why I believe that Ezra wrote it. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, we know David certainly sought the Lord. He had, a, he had a love for the Word of God. Um, he had a desire for it. But he was also king. He was also a man of war. David had a lot of responsibility that was on him in his position in Israel. When we come and look at Ezra, Ezra was a man whose life was simply consumed with the Word of God. It would be him where you could see him actually writing where every thought he's putting down is going back to the Bible. Not only in relation to who he was, but what his mission was, uh, what God gave him to do as far as his mission, as far as God's will for his life. His life was all about the Bible. He knew that the Bible was key to getting the nation of Israel right again after coming out of captivity. He, he recognized all the compromise that was taking place within the men of Israel, and he had to get it right. He's a guy, when you go through and see the decisions he had to make between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you're just like, wow. I mean, he had some tough calls to make. They had all the pagan wives, and he instructs them to divorce him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Th think of the dilemma he was facing with that call. He was faced with a lot. He was a key figure in Israel's return from Babylon. As we know, there's three different returns. The first one was, was led by Zerubbabel. Now, who remembers? We, we covered this on the Men of Faith, I don't know, a year or two ago. Zerubbabel was a descendant of who? Which line are we dealing with? King David. He was the kingly line. He led the very first return to the nation of Israel. And what did he do first? He built the temple. He got the temple up and going. After you see the temple completed, that's your first six verses, basic, first six chapters, excuse me, of the book of Ezra. Now we're introduced to Ezra. Ezra comes on the scene. He leads the second return out of captivity, and he comes. And when he arrives, he's basically brokenhearted. He sees the people still hardly living for God at all. He sees the condition that they're in spiritually, and, and it was tearing him up. Um... And so he leads the second return, and he is key. The temple is now built, and his emphasis is all about the Word of God. I would consider this verse, which is one of my favorite verses in the book of Ezra. If you're going to commit one verse to, memory, to memorize, I believe it should be Ezra 7.10. I think it's good to memorize one verse in every book of the Bible. It says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That's what he was consumed with. As a great pattern for our life. Israel was all, Ezra was all about getting the people in the word of God and obeying it. 
he was going to face many struggles and trials considering what the Lord was leading him to do. Again, making the tough decisions he had to go through. Um, uh, you know, you, you had, you had a, 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 a still I, I, an idolatrous, almost worldview at the time. He had, his ta he had a great task ahead of him. You can see the anguish of his soul as he dealt with the difficult issues in just in the few chapters that we have on his life. It would not have been easy to have been Ezra. It would not have been popular to have been him. Again, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he was greatly disappointed. He did not find people serving the Lord with gladness, but they were still very worldly. He wanted the people to seek God, and in a sense, as you're going through the book, it's almost as if Ezra is blaming himself for the change not occurring quick enough. He wanted the people to know how important the Word of God is. He knew that was the key to changing the culture of Jerusalem, which is another reason why I think he wrote Psalm 119. He wanted the people to desire God to obey him. I think the key to his life is found in the concluding words of Ezra chapter 7 and verse 9, where it said this, God's hand was upon him. That was key to his life. I think Psalm 119 shows us how we can have God's hand upon our life. So we're going to look at a portion of Psalm 119 tonight to begin that process to have God's hand in our life. We're going to be looking at Psalm, again, 25 through 32. We have the psalmist here going from cleaving, cleaving to the dust uh, uh, to running after God. And that's where we need to be. This is what I hope to accomplish today is to set us on that path, to get you from, uh, from clinging to the dust to running after God. And again, how does this happen? Well, you can see the amazing process here in these few eight verses that we have. Now let's get into this a little bit. One, does everybody have a book? Anybody that we short in any books right now? All right, Psalm 119 here. Let's, let's, let's begin this and get into verse 25. He starts off by saying, My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. We see his condition. Dust, the word dust is throughout the word of God. His soul is cleaving to it, of course, he says here. We see it in the very beginning in Genesis. We see even, even, even as a result of the curse of man's uh, returning to the dust of the earth. It reminds us of our, of our own brokenness and as a result of the fall. But dust in verse 25 here is primarily referring to this world, to this earth. It's almost another word for the word earth itself. And his soul is cleaving to this world. His soul is cleaving to this earth. It's cleaving to the dust. And the word cleave here means glued to, stuck on. The psalmist's soul was cleaving to this earth. It was cleaving to this world. In other words, he's dealing with his own sinful condition before God, as we're going to see borne out by the next verse when he does get into confession. Where he was, and this is dealing with a man who's a believer, not a lost person. He's saying his soul had this desire as so if he's stuck, still cleaving to the things of this world. He was stuck to it, and he couldn't find a way out. He lacked strength to change his course. He was broken over it. It's very similar to what we see in Romans chapter 7 with the Apostle Paul when he had brought up how the good that I would that I do not, yet the evil that I would not that I do. How, how, how he had this struggle within, yet there was this significant portion of him that was stuck to the things of this world. He was lacking the strength to be able to change his course. Ezra here, or the psalmist here, is mentioning the same thing. And again, I think we have way, way, way too many Christian, way too many men today whose soul is simply cleaving to the dust. And listen, this is, the word is cleaving. So this isn't by accident. It's not by accident that you're carnal and worldly. It's not by accident that your soul is cleaving to the dust. It isn't falling either. It's cleaving. It's, it's gluing to, here was another word-for-word -word definition of that Hebrew word, to catch by pursuit. To catch by pursuit. That your flesh has such a strong inclination towards the things of this world that it's pursuing it, that it can catch it. That it can grab hold of it. And that's where Ezra is saying, the psalmist is saying, my soul is cleaving to the dust. He's tired of it. And you know what your soul is cleaving to in this world. 
Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's simply living for self or living for lust. The psalmist is grieving over his inability to become unstuck. He needs help. He knows he doesn't have the strength to overcome this. And again, what I'm hoping to get us to see here today is to get us from our soul, from no longer cleaving to the dust of this world, but running after God. The fact is, living for the things of this world is no way to live. As we're going to see, it leads to despair. It leads to your life basically living a lie, a life of emptiness, a life that isn't even real. Not even real. So his condition in 25a is the fact that his soul is cleaving to the dust. And it is dealing with this world, this earth. He's tired of it. He knows where his soul is, his attachment to this wicked, vile world, and he knows it needs to change. But then you see his craving. Quicken thou me according to thy word. He wanted to be quickened. He wanted to be made alive. He was desiring life. And again, this is not dealing with the lost man. We know according to Ephesians chapter 2 that the lost certainly need a quickening. They're dead in their trespasses and sins and need God to make them alive. We understand that, but that's not what we're dealing with here. What we're dealing with is a man who does know God. His soul is cleaving to the dust of this earth and he's tired of it. And he knows the quickening he needs is going to come from God's word. It's going to come from God and his word. If he's going to have the life that he needs. <clears throat> this is a quickening for those who do know the Lord. There are times we all need that in our life when we need fresh life. We need a revival in our soul. And that always starts with going to God and his word. See, there is life-giving power in the Word of God. I think what, what, what I'm hoping to do, even in the Sunday night series, is, and I know this by experience because I live it as well, just like you. I think we need a fresh approach to God's Word, or, or just a, maybe fresh is the wrong word, although I, it, it does apply to a certain degree. We need a right approach to God's Word. I think because our perspective and our viewpoint is off of what this book is, it affects how we live it. And it doesn't have the power in it. It lacks what it has more than the ability to do in your life. It's not life-giving as it should be in your life. There are times, again, we need quickening, we need fresh life, we need revival in our soul. And it all starts with going to God and His Word. Listen, Ezra comes up in, on Jerusalem. He sees there, there's nobody even serving the Lord with gladness. He understands they've come out of Babylon, although he did expect like this great when he's get there. I mean, you can just see, man, this is going to be great when I get there. No doubt he's heard, word has got there, the temple is built. And yet, he arrives... And that's not the case. There's still a cleaving to the dust of uh, cleaving to the dust to this world. Even though the, the temple had been rebuilt, there was celebration with it. There, there was some desire there for God, but he, but he understood. Listen, there, there's there's still a mess going on. There's nobody here serving the Lord with gladness. And again, really, I hope the whole series, not only just today on Psalm 119, changes your life and your view towards the Bible, elevating how you approach it and apply it. <clears throat> again, the psalmist here has the desire to change and know the quickening comes from God's Word. Again, I mentioned this in, I don't remember which message it was here recently. Desire is a very important emotion. In what you desire. If this is going to be accomplished, where you see him in verse 1, he's recognizing his condition, and he truly desires a change. When that's in place, you're ready 
to begin the process to run after God. We need to head the Lord and ask him for that life. Ask him to use his word in us to provide life. Then that brings us to verse 26. He says, I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. The very next thing that it leads him to is desiring forgiveness. Is confession. He, he recognizes, he, he sees where his soul is at. It's cleaving to the dust. He knows that he needs life, and he's going to the Lord. So says, I know that I need life. So the very first thing he takes care of is confession before God. He needs forgiveness. When you realize your depressed state as a result of being attached to this world, the very first step then is confession. And listen, it's more than just saying as part of your daily prayer, Lord, forgive me of my sins. True confession is always accompanied by a desire for true repentance. That's good. Amen. You can get into a rut in your life in your prayer time where, where your confession of sins just happens to be a part of your prayer time. Where there's not an element of heart, there's not an element of repentance. It's just going through motions in your life. Right. That's right. Understand where this man's at right here. That's not where he's at. I've declared my ways. Thou hurtest me. Uh, God, I, I'm honest before you with this. I, I know where I'm at. I see my own ways. And he's declaring those before God. Again, true confession is born of a desire to get unstuck. It should never be just part of a vain prayer life. Now, this is important here when it comes to confession. I think we have a truth here that, that's associated with. He says, I have declared my ways, and thou hurtest me. By declaring his ways... It shows, one, that pride has been removed. Pride has been removed. It's gone. He declared his own ways before God. His own failures, his own faults, his own sins. There's, there's no indication here whatsoever that he's blaming others for his own sinfulness. He wasn't saying, God, it was because I was in Babylon. You knew the wickedness that was all around me. No, he's removing pride. He's removing the excuses. He's simply declaring his own ways. He's not blaming others for his own sinfulness. That's always an element of true confession. He wasn't using the victim card for his woeful condition. It was his own sin. It was his own life. It was his own way that he chose. You keep on blaming others for your sin, you'll lack true confession. Only thing you're doing in your prayer time is, is, is actually complaining about others. Right. Right. And until you see it's your own ways that are destroying you and not others. Right. That's a key to getting your life right. That's a key to actually getting your soul from cleaving to the dust and begin the process of running after God. <clears throat> it was not the fault of others as to his soul's condition but it was a result of his own ways and his own doing. And then notice where the heart goes after confession. He said, I have declared my ways. And then, of course, we have the great thing we know whenever we truly pray to God, and thou hurtest me, the forgiveness is there. God's grace, mercy, long suffering, all that's there. But no, notice the punctuation, it's a colon. As soon as he gets forgiveness, teach me thy statutes. His thoughts go right to God's word. It runs there. True confession will always lead you to God's word. It's that desire to go to it. And you see that throughout. That was going to be one of, uh, when I first sat down to go through uh, uh, the three messages today, the first one was going to be just simply on the desire that you see of the psalmist throughout. Uh, of, of going after whole heart and whole heart, the desire for the word of God, the desire for the commandments. And once he has the confession right, that's where he, that's where he now goes to, is to the word of God. 
let make no mistake about it. Again, I do believe it's Ezra. Ezra's approach to the Bible really is incredible when you see it in just in the few chapters we have of his life. The way that he elevated it. He, I mean, he really realized the power that was there. When true confession hits, it wants to go to God's word. So he recognizes his condition to start off with here. My soul is cleaving to the dust. He knows no answers. So, so he, 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 uh, the first prayer he, sh he shoots up is going to the Lord where he wants to end up. Quicken thou me according to thy word. And I'm not going there right now, but just take, look where he ends up though by verse 32. I will run the way of thy commandments. After he recognizes his condition, he goes before God in confession without pride, recognizing how his own way, where it took him in his life. And then we're going to come up on to the next verse, but we are going to do that because that's a long one and it's too important, and I do not want to split that up. So I think it'll be good, actually, to stop here. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. That one's really important, especially in all of our lives for parents, uh, I do not want to have to stop in the middle, and I think, it's going to, I think it's going to take me a little bit of time to cover that one. So we're, we're going to break right now. All right, a couple of things here as we go to get started. Remember last time during the Parents of Faith, we discussed the Caleb track. It is out. We picked them up last night from the printer, so that is here. Now we're going to have two versions. If you remember, we discussed it. Matt came up to let you know that... This version with Caleb like this gets very detailed with the disease he has. And so that information with the result of that disease is what we, again, that, that Caleb does not know and that decision is up to mom and dad when they're going to let him know. So that's why these will always be secured. If you see one of these lying around church, you pick it up um, and get it out of, we, again, we don't, wanna, we don't want one of our other children reading this and then going to Caleb and giving away information that Caleb does not need to know right now. All right, does everybody understand that? And again, we will have another version without that information, and it will have a different picture of Caleb on the front, and that one will be just fine. Uh, so that is out now, so you're going to start seeing those around. Um, that'll come out. And before we start this, there's a couple things I want to do before we get into the session. Uh, I've asked uh, Richard Bope if he'd come on up. He's one of our newer members, and uh, I'm certainly glad the Lord has sent him to us. He is getting involved in ministry. He's certainly excited. And you're 79 right now, is that right? How old are you? I'll be 79 in June. Be 79 years. And, and he has such a desire to be used of God still. Just amazing. He's in our radio ministry now. He's helping to edit sermons for the radio. And he's always telling me how that helps him with him getting into the Word of God. So I said, you know, brother, it, that'll go with the theme of what I'm preaching on for here. So I'd like to give you just a testimony of how that's helping your life. So I'll let you speak here. Let me give this to you. You can just clip that on or something right there. Okay. Does it work? Anyway, without going into a lot of detail about how I got there, I am in the radio ministry, and I'm loving it. And when I went into it, when I first started, all I ever expected to get out of it was the knowledge that I was doing something to help the Lord. That's all I expected. <laughs> first thing that happened was I discovered that I really enjoy doing that. The second thing that happened, I have always, all my life, never been able to get up in the morning. 10 o'clock maybe, 9.30, that's early. Since I started doing that radio message, I find I'm able to get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock. Gives me time to do the radio ministry, edit those messages, which takes a little time, and also gives me a little extra time for what I want to do. But the real beauty of it is, spending the time that I have to spend to edit one of those messages, I'm spending one or two hours a day listening to pastor preach. And I find that I am getting insights into the Bible, insights into the Lord. I seem to be just drawing closer. And another, and, and on top of that, I'm getting insights into what's going on in my life now, which is causing me to have a little more peace, a little more joy and contentment. 
And I'm getting insights to what's been going on in my life clear back to when I was two or three years old. It's amazing. Uh, and I just, I don't know, there's, there's so much I could say, but the Lord is just blessing me terribly, and it's wonderful. <laughs> You know, one thing when you're pastoring that uh, it, it, it is rewarding is when you see growth. When you see people actually growing in the Lord. And just a couple of weeks ago, he came to me and said, uh, you know, that thing we're doing, you're doing on Saturdays, going out and knocking on doors? I'm coming. I'm going to start coming to that. And you can see the growth take place. And that's exciting to see. And so, brother, I appreciate that. appreciate how the Word of God is certainly helping in your life. And we have one more thing I want to do right here. Jim Farr, where's he at? Come on up here, brother. Stop eating. My, you're always eating, Jim. Thank you for holding dinner until the breakfast so I got it. <laughs> brother Farr, we certainly love you. Anyhow, hopefully I'll get through this here. As the men of IBCA, we want to honor you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we certainly appreciate your example, right. uh, your love for prayer, uh, your love for souls. And uh, um, anyhow, uh, we had this made up for you. It says to Jim Farr, thank you for being a man of faith. The men of, of <clears throat> IBCA appreciate your godly example and zeal for souls. The verse I put on here is Mark 11:22. I know that's not a light verse for you, but it was the verse that came to mind over and over as I was praying for this. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. Amen, Amen brother. Thank you. We love you. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank you. Very you. Much. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's get back into Psalm 119. <clears throat> All right, Psalm 119. We've covered 25 and 26. We see his condition and his confession coming about. And of course, his desire to leave all that. My soul cleave unto the dust. And, and, and his response, he knew what he needed because of the condition that he was in. It, it's quicken thou me according to thy word. And, and sin, when you're living in sin and living for the world, that always leaves you in that dead condition. There's no real life there for you at all. You're living that lie. You're living for vanity. He has the confession that takes place. And then verse 27. He says, Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Boy, this is an important section right here. An important verse uh, that we're going to cover. From now, after confession, he goes on to his un where he knows he has a need for comprehension. He has a need for understanding. And he knows that that understanding will lead into a change in his very conversation. He is desiring an understanding of God's word. He knows that he needs it. He desired not simply to know God's word, but to understand it. And there's a difference there. I think a lot of times our problem simply ends with the knowledge of the Word of God and we lack the understanding. But if you're going to get to a place where you're no longer cleaving to the dust of this earth and running after God, understanding has to be in place in your life. We have a great need to understand what we learn. True learning includes understanding. I think our culture today is even removing more and more the vital necessity of understanding when it comes to knowledge. Let me give you an example. Can I see your, your phone for a second? With technology today, and this is just by way of illustration to show you what happens. We have knowledge at our fingertips, but where it's hurting us is it's taking away understanding. For instance, I can use this phone right now and put any address in, and it'll get me there. The only thing I have to do is do this. Drive, turn right. <laughs> I'll go a little bit further, turn left. You've arrived at your destination. The knowledge it had got me to where I was going in a sense, but I definitely lacked understanding. When I traveled, when we were traveling for debutation, you know, I had to have understanding with the knowledge. I had to have maps open, and I understood the path that I was taking. Yes, sir. Do you understand? There's a difference there. 
just like right now, even, even when it comes to knowledge with the generation we have up and coming right now, you can Google whatever you want. That's not understanding. That's just retrieving information. There's a difference. There's a difference between being, having the ability, the comprehension of something, than just the knowledge of something. Understanding, uh, am, am I? Yes, I am. And, and again, a desire uh, 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 is key for the understanding, a, a searching, if you will. But he had desired this comprehension. He had desired to understand. We certainly need understanding. And again, desire is key for this. You see, duty might get you up every morning to read the Word of God, and I hope it is. I, you know, I hope every day that you're in the Bible. Do you understand how, how crippling your walk is if you are not in the Bible every day? That's right. Well, I just don't have time. That is such a, a lame excuse. You have to go all the way back to verse 25 and recognize your, your, your horrible condition that you're in. Mm -hmm. Your need for a quickening. You should be in it every day. But I go, to work at, I go to work at 5 in the morning. It really doesn't matter. It, your, 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 your perception is skewed. So then get up at 3 and read. Exactly. That's right. Amen. Preach it. <clears throat> we need to be in it every day. Yes, sir. Yep. Duty might keep you reading the Word of God each day, but it is desire for God's Word that will lead you to understanding. Uh, both are essential. Not only the duty aspect of it, but also the desire of it. As independent fundamental Baptists, too often what we emphasized was the duty of it. Without the desire for it. So there was a lot of knowledge there, but there wasn't understanding with that knowledge. And that can be crippling to a Christian life. It can be crippling to your family. Look over in Nehemiah chapter 8. I want you to know something here about the life of Ezra. Ezra, again, <clears throat> who I believe wrote this psalm, he knew the importance of understanding when it came to the Word of God. Understanding was, as you were going to see, it was a goal of his when he arrived in Jerusalem. Uh, let me get to the verse here. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 2. And Ezra the priest who is also, by the way, he is of the line of Aaron. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear. Now notice, notice what his goal was. With understanding. Upon the first day of the seventh month. You're going to see that continuing. It gets into pretty good detail here of Ezra's process of presenting the word of God to the people. And his goal is it's beginning to let us know there, as it's laying the foundation in verse 2 for what is to come, he's telling us what, it, what his goal was, was to provide a measure of understanding for the people. One, because when he is going to come with these hard decisions that they're going to have to face, they had better have understanding down if they're going to be willing to make the right decision. It's going to be more than just Ezra's words. Understanding was a goal of his when he arrived in Jerusalem. See, we have to leave here determined not to just read the Bible, but to search it out for understanding. Listen, un understand, look over in the book of Proverbs with me. Go to the book, book of Proverbs. I think you have these listed in your notes. <clears throat> understanding is, is very important in our life. When it comes to the Bible, Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Right. Understanding, one, it comes from God. Understanding, verse 11 says, it'll, it'll keep thee. Discretion shall preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. It, it's going to serve as that guard in your life. It's what's going to keep you from going back to the dust. Right. It's what's going to keep you from constantly falling back into the trap of the world. And I have a different reference than you do in your notes. I changed it later for this next one. Where understanding goes hand in hand with wisdom. I'm still in Proverbs chapter 2, but going back to verse 2 and reading down through verse 5. So that thou incline thine ear 
unto wisdom. And ten of the verses I have listed for you do the same thing. I just like these a little bit better. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifted up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. It's always associated with wisdom. The two are relatives. The two go hand in hand. With understanding comes the right company. And I'll read the verse here in Proverbs chapter 12. It says this, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. You'll actually, it's through understanding, God-given understanding, that you actually uh, do understand the, uh, the importance of who you spend your time with of the importance of the right company. Proverbs 13 and verse 15, it says, Good understanding giveth favor. I know that's one of the things I pray and ask God for all the time is for His favor on my life. Yeah. With understanding comes the ability to control anger. Mm -hmm. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. Understanding leads to a right walk, Proverbs 15, 21, which says, Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. It's understanding that, that, that carries all this fruit in our life. In, in Proverbs 16, 22, which we, we can think back to uh, the whole purpose of, 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 the, of, the, of the portion of Psalm 19, Ren, it says this, Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. But the instruction of fools is folly. Understanding is a key to life. This is what the psalmist is searching for. Understanding is key. Now, this last one I want you to see, especially for your parents. Proverbs chapter 24. It says, Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is, esta it is established. Your home is established by understanding. <clears throat> Listen, this, this truth that we see here in this verse, and the importance of understanding, can completely change your entire home. What was that verse back to? That's Proverbs 24.3. It is so important that not only yourself, but your spouse and your children, that you are emphasizing the importance of understanding of the Word of God and not just the knowledge of the Word of God. It should be part of your home devotions. In my home, that was one of the motives for how I did my home devotions. I needed to make sure understanding was present. Yes, that's right. It was too valuable in their life just to miss. I just didn't need five children that could quote Scripture. Yes, right. That's right. I just didn't need five children that, that didn't miss church because I was in church. I knew that if my kids were going to make it when they're out of my house, if understanding's not there, it's gone. If they don't have understanding, my home is not established. Right. And so even when we do the devotions, when they come down, it is, it, is, it, it is simply from their personal devotions, they bring something to their family devotions. Every one of them. And you read it. And then know what I want to listen to next? Is your understanding of it. And then know what I can do? Because they're all children. They're, they're growing up to it. Then I can help provide the guidance for the understanding. And you know what, know what that's going to do for them? It's going to keep them. Know what it's going to do for them? It's going to help them walk uprightly. Know what it's going to do? It's going to help them to control their anger. The Bible's not make-believe. It's simply not having them in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. That's the key. It's simply not having them involved in soul winning. That's the key. All those things are good and right, and if you're not doing them, you're wrong. But we looked at those as the solution to everything. They weren't the solution at all. It was just a certain measure of obedience. <clears throat> One of the reasons we lose a lot of our kids is because we fail to provide understanding that goes with the obedience. Your children know how to obey. I mean, your mom and dad, they're growing up in a Christian home. They learn obedience as a part of it. But many times it is just because you say so. It's what we do at our church. If they lack understanding, you are in trouble. Yes, sir. 
your home will not be established. We can take, for example, there's many different issues that, 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 that I can use for example of this, but we can use right now the modesty issue that's going through all of our churches and the changing of it. The changing of the dress standards. You want to know why that so drastically changes and so many churches are running away from it? Simply because there's a lack of understanding. That was never present. It just wasn't there. Therefore, as the culture changed, people saw no problem with that. It was kind of like the very first time I heard. When I started serving Christ, I've been about a year at it now, and I'm sitting in a church, and the guy preached against kissing your girlfriend, uh, or waiting until you're married to kiss, you know, have that very first kiss. I was like, what? That's insane. Who does that? <laughs> really? I, it was absurd to me. You know what I didn't have? Understanding. Right. Right. I had no understanding. It was presented to me because from my worldview and the culture that I grew up around, it's completely foreign to me, the whole concept. What I lacked was understanding. Your children need to know why we do what we do from a biblical perspective. They need to know why it's important to be in church. Dad, you're the one who has to sit down and teach him these things. You have, to, you have to be able to teach your children why being in church is more important than sports. Yes, sir. Right. Exactly. You can see it all the time where, where, I mean, I can see it all the time where parents are setting their own children up for failure and they don't even see it. Because of lack of understanding. And you know where that begins, by the way? It's many times because we don't have the understanding. And until you recognize your condition and come before God with, with that confession and desiring Him and begin begging God for the understanding, searching for it, desiring it, they're never going to have it. It's when you're searching for it as, as for treasure. It's recognizing the value that it has in your life. You know, the different things that we have and the different standards that we have and the different things that we, we present before our children between what's wrong and what's right, understanding has to be in place. I assure you, there's a very real battle for their souls. There's a very real battle for the direction of their life. And if the understanding is in place, there's no establishment there. And it's very easy to swoop them away. We should be praying that the eyes of our children are given understanding that they're opened. Because if not, it's too easy to be deceived. Too easy to be deceived. Now as we see in our verse, understanding leads to a change in your conversation. Notice back in Psalm 119. <clears throat> Again, I love how he, the direction that the Lord goes with this here in the psalm now. The result of understanding. And he knows he needs this. He knows it's going to be key to getting his soul out of the dust. It's understanding. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. And then look where he goes now. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. It's going to change his very conversation. All of a sudden, he knows the desire is going to be there to talk of God's ways. You know why you don't want to talk of God? You lack understanding. you got shame in regards to God. You don't want to bear a reproach. You want to know why? You lack understanding. And I want you to notice something very important. Please don't miss this. This is sort of a side thing. I'm going to back to the subject. Notice what term he uses for the word of God here. Precepts. I think that's important. He wasn't all concerned with the prophecies, but the precepts. He wasn't, he was, in other words, the precepts is dealing with the everyday things of life. The, 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 the certain things that call for a measure of obedience and a measure of guidance. Not just the fun and, and, and different things, amazing things about it. He says, listen, what I need to know is what has my soul in the dust. What's going to get it out is your precepts. It's those things of everyday life in the Word of God. I think that's important. Too often we seek understanding of things that really have nothing to do with self-denial and nothing to do with obedience. 
and our soul is still cleaving to the dust. Now, back to the subject. And of course, it makes sense the direction he goes with this, because how can you really talk about something that you don't understand? How can you talk about something you really don't understand? I mean, you can listen to Jerry and Josiah talk about different computers and things like that at another level that none of us understand. One, they're geeks as anything. So, uh, But it's what they understand. It's what they know. But you, every single one of us in here has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The, the, the biggest thing we need to understand is right here. Yep. And as you have that understanding, it's going to change your conversation. It's going to change what you want to talk about. Because again, you can't talk about something you don't understand. Mm -hmm. If you're really going to talk about something with passion, understanding has to be in place. Even when it came to the gospel. Uh, again, it has all the elements of the gospel. I'm not trying to attack it too much. I'm just attacking how, how it developed over decades within the 20th century. We were all taught the Roman road. Do you know what we are missing? Understanding. So when we talk with people, it wasn't necessarily with passion. It was out of obedience. There's a difference when you're able to talk from a position of understanding. Because when, with understanding comes God's wondrous works. It changes your approach. Do you, you know why those of you who have been through the soul winning class that I teach, do you know what the bulk of that is? It's simply trying to get you to understand the gospel. Because you know what's going to happen when you understand it? You see God's wondrous works. And from there, you'll talk of them. You'll talk of them. That's why I take so much time in teaching that class. The more understanding you have of God, the more you're going to want to talk about Him. Now, this is interesting when we think about it in relation to secular knowledge. Many times, with secular knowledge, wonder goes away with understanding. It does. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, you can take an illusionist. You know, uh, um, I had uh, um, uh, some of the boys were staying the night at my house. Um, I, I think Jacob McDonald Hall, Hall was there, and Levi was there, and so I did a, I did a, uh, got out the Uno cards, and I did, and I did a card trick, showed them how to do this, and they're just wow, just amazing. Take it down to this very last card, and it's, it's kind of neat to go through it. But if they had understanding of how that came about, they'd be like, what? That's it? That's all there is to that? That's all there is to it. With understanding and secular knowledge, many times comes a lack of wonder. You're like, oh, okay, I get it. I see how that works now. You know, when you first, you know, I, I remember uh, um, before I understood even how the combustible engine even worked, just being amazed by it. But then when I understood, I'm like, oh, I see. With God, the opposite takes place. The more you learn, the more you understand, the more your wonder increases the more you're amazed by it. It doesn't lead to a commonness of God, to a, oh, that's how God does that. I knew that. <laughs> that's not how that goes. As you learn of Him, it doesn't become common. It becomes even more wonderful and more beautiful. We need an understanding of God's Word. Do you understand that? You want to know why we have these things? Men of faith? You want to know why we have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? To provide understanding. To provide understanding. You want to know what will happen? Your home will be established. It will help you walk in an upright way. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's going to affect every aspect of your life. <clears throat> and so that's part of my job is to help provide understanding. But not only that, to try and get you in a place where of your own accord you can gain understanding. Charles Spurgeon said this, and boy, did he hit the nail on the head. The guy had a way with words. He said, blind obedience has small beauty. Let that sink in for a minute with what we're talking about right now. Blind obedience has small beauty. What he's saying is, as you're trying to follow the Lord, 
but it's without understanding. There's not much beauty in it. But with understanding, your eyes are opened. And there's great beauty in it. Blind obedience has small, small beauty. We need to follow God with our eyes open, with understanding. That is seeing the beauty of the Lord. It takes the, the, the grunge out of it. It takes the, 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 the burned outness of it. Listen, I don't care who you are. If you're a pastor, when you get burned out, you're lacking understanding. You're missing what it's about. It's time to, time to reprioritize your life. So he goes from his condition. He recognizes. He knows he needs life. He, he, is, he, he confesses his sins before God. God hears him. He goes to God's word. And, and, and when, in relation to God's word, the very next thing that he asks God to do for him is, please make me to understand the way of thy precepts. Understanding is critical. And then he knew what that would lead to. It change his whole conversation. Then he would talk of God's wondrous ways. Now, the next verse, he's now referring back to his current condition he's in. Okay? Where his soul, because as a result of his soul cleaving unto the dust. He, again, he's, it's not, it's not, it's not a... a, a um, the, the first portion is what's still in the context of a prayer, but it's not in a request right now. It's stating where he's at because of the condition of his soul. He says, My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen, strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Now I have calamity in your book. It's really a bad word for it. It's depression, though. I needed a C. I had it. I had it a D because usually I won't change that. And Rachel even pleaded with me to change it to calamity. I said, "All right, I'll, 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 I'll make it a C." But really, what we're dealing with is depression. My soul melteth for heaviness. It's it's almost like being poured out. Something poured out. Try and get that back in a cup. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. The soul is melting. He's dealing with this current state of depression. His soul is in anguish, as if it could be poured out. He's in great distress. Why? Because he knows where he should be. This is a believer. He knows where his life should be in relation to God, and he's not there. And depression is set in. He's disappointed in the decisions he made and the choices he's made. And he reckoned that my soul is in this great heaviness. I know it's cleaving to the dust, and it should not be here. In this case, understand this. The emotion of depression is a good thing. It's what's going to help lead him to repentance. Now the question is though, which way do you turn when depression hits? Yes, sir. Where he went to immediately, he understood his depressed condition. So he says, strengthen thou me according unto thy word. But because we lack understanding, we lack understanding of, 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 of even foundational truths of the word of God. We can't go there to get help for our soul. So many today turn to medication simply to mask the symptoms. See, what doctors figured out is it's simply, uh, it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. All right, listen, let, let Brain controls a lot of us, if you didn't notice that. If you don't know, we can get into a simple biology. I have no doubt with the different things that God allows to take place in our life emotionally, it's going to be connected to the brain. But the problem is not the chemical imbalance. It's what's leading to that is the problem. But many turn to simply medication to mask the symptoms. Again, they're told it's an imbalance, and we have a treatment for that. You're just going to take this pill. The problem is you're not seeing it. It's not a chemical imbalance. It's a problem with your soul. Right. Depression is a problem with, your, with, with where your soul is at in relation to the Creator. That then triggers a chemical imbalance, an emotion that God wants to release called depression. And unless you recognize that it's a problem with your soul, you're not going to deal with it at that level. 
I'm not necessarily against people taking medication for, for different things like that. But I, I, I would ask that you have to treat it at the true, at the spiritual condition that you're dealing with. I think we fail to see how humanistic, uh, uh, um, the humanistic philosophy of our day has crept into our theology. See, the problem is, if you think that's the real problem, is that chemical imbalance, and you're going to take drugs to treat it, just stop the drugs. Those drugs are just allowing those happy things to be released. You stop the drugs, guess what comes back? The depression. Because you'd never dealt with the problem. You simply masked the symptoms. That's all you did. <clears throat> Many don't turn to drugs when it comes to depression. They turn to escapism. This is more common, I would say. I say dominates our culture. They turn to escapism. They try and get their mind in anything else but the vanity of their life. They'll sit in front of a TV and watch Netflix for eight hours. Get them from work, just boom. Just forget about life. Go live in a fantasy world for a while. It's called escapism. I've watched people who are depressed turn to something new, and for a while they're fine. They find a new job, a new thing, and all of a sudden they have this burst. You know, I, I remember when uh, reading about this online, and again, I'm, I'm not against this, but I'm going to bring it up because it fits the illustration. I, I remember reading online as, as the business opportunities of Plexus were going crazy. And also I'm reading online about all these different women that said, man, I battle depression, I've taken this pink drink, and I'm fine. And I'm thinking, no, you're, you're not realizing it. That has nothing to do with why all of a sudden you're feeling fine. What you found was a glimpse moment of time where you found a purpose. Yes, sir. And it made you feel good. Because you were living apart from that. But, but that's not the real purpose. So just give that some time. That's going to go away. Because your real purpose doesn't have to do with selling a pink drink. It has to do with the Creator. That's the one that will last. But people search for that in different things or try and find this thing, this new thing, and this new thing. It doesn't work because the eye is never satisfied. And the depression comes back. The vanity of life comes back. They're looking for it all in the wrong direction. They think they're cured. Just, just give it a few days, a few weeks, or when that gets old. See, with God, as you gain more understanding with God, it doesn't become commonplace. It becomes wondrous. Until you deal with this at the soul level, you're never dealing with the root issue. The psalmist then turned to the Lord in prayer and to his word for strength. The hope in dealing with depression lies not with yourself, but with God. It is getting right. It is strengthening your relationship with him. It is when you can get up in the morning and you have that, that real walk with God where it's not fake. It's, it's built in truth and in a foundation and understanding that the creator is right there. It deals with our faith. I believe the soul is always searching for something until it meets up with the Creator. And even then when we're there, please understand, this, this point here that he's driving at is not a, 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 a single moment in time based on a decision. Okay? It's not. Because we all live in a sinful flesh. We can forget things very quickly in relation to our spiritual life. And so this requires maintenance on our part. It requires some work. It requires some maintaining in your life if you're going to keep that. You have to maintain that walk with God between your soul and Him. And to be honest, as a believer, I'm glad that I certainly don't feel right when that's not right. I want God to have something in place within my soul, within this body, that when I'm not walking with Him, I know something's not right. You see, one whose soul is melting for heaviness is a soul that needs communion with its Creator. And apart from that, depression will come in and the soul will look for anything to stop the emptiness. Even to the point of suicide. By seeking God, God begins first to deal with sin issues in your life. The things that are destroying your soul. He begins to do the repair work. 
the problems in your life. All of a sudden, you find yourself able to pray a little bit better, a little bit stronger. All of a sudden, you're praying, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Because it is the joy of the Lord that is the answer. You see, our approach to the Bible needs to change. We need to see it for the help that it is and get understanding. You want to know when you begin to see that, what you'll do is? Where, where's my card at? Fall down here. Some of you, as soon as you got these, I'd already determined I'm not memorizing anything. <laughs> yeah, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see the value in it. Our approach to the Bible needs to change. We need to see it for the help that it is and gain understanding. Again, it is here that strength for the soul is found and heaviness flees away. You get your relationship right with the Creator. All right, let's go ahead and stop here. We'll take a break. And, and... Anyhow, as he is talking about removing him uh, you know, from the way of lying, he wants his life to live in truth, not in a lie, but in reality. Again, and living a life uh, for self apart from God is always living a lie. When you're doing that, when you're living for self, when you're living for the flesh, like he had recognized where he was, he, he knew, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm living for something that isn't right, that isn't true. I, I'm, my, my way, the way that I live my life is nothing but a lie. It's not based in truth. It's living basically in your own make-believe world. The devil's good at that. Of the six to seven billion people on this earth, the majority of them actually live in a make-believe world and they don't even know it. Completely apart from truth. It's almost like they're asleep. Your soul is believing that living for this world is what it's all about. That's a lie. It's not what it's about. You've been deceived. You're living in the way of lying. He knows that he needs that to change. We need to wake up to be quickened. To have that life from God. So we can see things that are right. So we can see the error of the way that we're living in. Your sin will keep you in bondage in a fake world. While your precious life and the little time that you have disappears. If there's one thing we need to flee, it's living in the way of lying and running towards truth. And we notice here, when God's law is not present, lying moves right in. <clears throat> when God's word is not present, it simply moves lying right into your life. The only way to dispel a lie is to accept the truth. And if you're going to do that, you have to have understanding of the truth. God's word allows, will allow him to live a life of truth. That's why he's now praying to God that God would grant it unto him. I know I'm in the way of lying. Grant me thy law graciously. It's just not a series of commands to him. He understands the word of God. His approach to it is entirely different. He knows, listen, this is what I need. If, if I'm going to get out of the way of lying and stop living for vanity... I have to have God be able to grant to me, to give me what I need from His Word. Again, think about this. The Creator Almighty, we, me and Vince are talking just briefly of, uh, uh, about the universe and the vastness of it, and just how incredible it is. Listen, of the 1,189 chapters that are here, the 66 books that we have, of all the words that we have, I can't remember how many words there are, these were specifically chosen yes, for us to live on this earth. From the one who has complete understanding. Complete wisdom. Who knows right where you're at. Again, it's more than just something just to vainly memorize. It's understanding how, how desperately we need it to get us out of the way of lying. So he prays that God would change his way. That he remove him from the way of lying. And get him into his get him into his word. Again, if you have some sin that has a hold on your life, you're living in the way of lying. 
The answer is to get truth to dispel a lie. The lie that you have to have it. The lie that you can't overcome it. The lie that it's fine. The lie that everyone does it. The lie that no one's going to find out. The lie that everything's really fine with your life. Quit living in your world of make-believe. Right. Stop living in the way of lying. Mm -hmm. Turn towards truth. Right. And then we have a key verse now, verse 30. Now he makes a choice. Mm. He says, all right, now I'm choosing something here. I'm tired of the way of lying. I have chosen the way of truth. Right. That's a pretty good verse right there, isn't it? Yes, sir. I have chosen the way of truth. People, many of them, don't like to make that choice. One, because it's admitting you've been living for a lie. Do you understand that? That maybe it's going to hurt your pride that you are wrong about some things. Yes, sir. That's, that's not easy for any, especially men to do. To say, wait, uh, so I've been wrong about this? Yep. yep, that's exactly right. You've been wrong about it. Yep. You've been living the way of lying. Deception, deceit. The devil's a master at that. Do you understand that? He's been there for 6,000 years. He knows what he's doing. And if he gets you in the way of lying, he doesn't care if you go to church or not. Because right. you're not in the way of truth. <clears throat> Again, this verse is key. is making the choice, I'm going to go towards truth. Think of the decision the Apostle Paul had to make with that when he put his faith in Christ. I mean, here's a guy admitting, who had zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, like all those countrymen, Romans 10.1. He had to recognize that, wait, wait, I've been wrong about everything. I mean, I am actually think I'm serving God, and yet I'm going against Him with everything that I have. So everything, all, everything that I'm living for, it, 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 it's not true. I, I'm not serving God, I'm against Him. He was faced with that dilemma, but he chose the way of truth. Yep. He didn't allow pride to control the direction that he went with his life. Right. He was willing to, to suffer the humiliation before all of his colleagues. When, he, when they heard that, what, Paul did, what, Saul did what? Right. He became a Christian? Oh my goodness. Mm. Could you imagine the ridicule and the jokes that his colleagues had about him? Paul knew all that was going to come. He knew he'd lose all of his friends. Yeah. He knew the humiliation that went with it. But instead of choosing the way of a lie and the way of pride, he said, I'm going to choose the way of truth. Amen. Amen. Our life is made up of choices. When all of us got up this morning, we started making choices. Some of you made some really bad ones of the clothes you put on. <laughs> Bob would be a great example of that. That's a nice shirt. However, even though we make choices, and I think all those are important, there are key times when we make key choices in our life. When we're faced with life-altering choices. Like on the choice who to marry. That is life-altering. That will change your life. Like the choice, of course, when you heard the gospel. You had a choice to make when it was clear. Am I going to go this way or am I not? I remember hearing it June 30th, 1982 and knowing that's what I wanted. It was the way of truth in making that decision. And now let me move up to the three years later, summer of 1985. I made another crucial decision. I think it's, I think it's the same one that he's making here in verse 30. I am 15 years old. I'm starting to serve God for the first time. And understanding's be just beginning to come into play. I remember even a Sunday night service, just, it just hit. Life is all about God. Mm -hmm. right. And going forward and making the decision, Lord, my life is yours. You're what I want. That was a choice for truth. We need those key moments in our life. It's not just choosing to be faithful to church. I was already doing that. It's not just choosing to read your Bible every day. I was already doing that. It's not just choosing to pray every day. I was already doing that. It's saying, Lord, no, my life is yours. I am choosing for my life the way of truth. When I look back, I would never change that decision. I don't regret it for a second. Amen. I look back and... 
It certainly wasn't easy. Again, many of you know the story I've talked about it before when I entered my high school years. There was a, certainly was a lot of struggles with that, knowing I'm going to lose all my friends. Yeah. I enjoyed having friends, really did. It was nice. I'm 15 years old. And I knew if I do this, I'm losing them. Again, it wasn't, wasn't easy. And yet years I even look back to that time, and I still have people contacting me. I just had two, two friends contact me from high school about a month ago. Two of them. Used Facebook, sent, sent me a message, and then said, listen, when you're back in town, if you're ever preaching here, would you let us know? Amen. Wow. 2009, I, I brought this up before I even printed it out this time. Um, and this was a, a, a message on Facebook right here. That's all he sent, that, that little line. This is what he said. No, no hello or anything. But boy, this, this brought tears to my eyes the very moment I read it. You were right. Saved at age 31. Amen. Thought you'd like to know. Amen. Sorry for being belligerent to you in high school. Will you forgive me, Mike? Amen. What a blessing. Good. That's a good pastor. I don't regret the decision. Right before I left New Guinea, about three or four months before I left, I had a, a girl I knew in high school. It was actually the, the last girl that I dated before I started serving Christ. Contacted me. Her name was Sabrina. And she contacted me. Her life just completely a mess. And first time I talked to her since high school. I haven't talked to her one time since high school. And she just said, I have no idea what to do. And I got a hold of a pastor. I preached in her area frequently. Got a hold of a pastor and said, uh, I said, it was a Saturday, her Saturday. And I said, why don't you head to this church in the morning? Head to it. I called the pastor up. I said, you're going to have somebody coming into your church tomorrow. And gave him some background. She showed up. Amen. Put her faith in Christ two weeks later. Amen. Baptized the next week. And in Christ, in church, serving him. Amen. That's good, pastor. It's choosing the way of truth. Amen. Our life is made up of choices. The only thing I would change looking back would certainly give much more of myself to the Lord. The psalmist knew there were many paths in life he could choose. He chose the way of truth. You too have choices to make in your life. Again, we're not talking about making the choice to be faithful to church. We're not talking the choice simply to read your Bible every day. All those things need to be in place. Those need to be decisions that we make. But it's choosing the way of truth for your life. See, we can choose today to live for a career, to live for success, to live for popularity, to live for pleasure, to live for nothing. To live a life with the least amount of resistance possible. But really, there's only two choices. The way of truth or the way of lying. The way of lying will form itself in many, all those different ways I just described. We need to choose the way of truth. If you're going to be able to run after God, you have to choose the way of truth. After that choice is made, what's next? Now, this is interesting. Look at this. He said, I've chosen the way of truth, colon again. Here's where he goes right after that decision. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Now, this is what he did. Notice the wording here. It's what he did after he chose that way. He got God's word before him. He put it before him. He put it before his mind's eye. He put it before his eye. He says, I, I am putting thy judgments before me. You get truth before you. If you're choosing the way of truth, then get truth before you. Right. The choice and maintaining this doesn't happen by accident. It does take determination. It does take study. It does take consideration. Keep it before your mind's eye. Keep it before your physical eye. Study it. Memorize it. Yeah. Memorize it. Get it before you. If you're going to choose the way of truth, you've got to know it. You have to know it. Verse 31. 31 was a little bit of a harder one to interpret in this section of verses. Because of the tense. I have stuck unto thy testimonies. It's not future. He's saying, this is where I'm at right now. Even though, and see the, word, see the word cleaveth in verse 25, and the word stuck is the exact same Hebrew word. It's the same word used. 
So while he's stating that I am stuck, I'm cleaving to this earth, to the dust, yet here in the same tense, it's, to me it would have been easier to interpret had it been future tense. Or as a result. He said, I have stuck under thy testimonies. Now this is, in, in other words, by the sense, it's in place now. It wasn't just the result of his decision. Uh, uh, but then, but then, then you can see the understanding of why that's exactly how it should be written. Because we are dealing with a believer, even though his soul was cleaving under the dust, the very thing that gave him comfort, the very thing that did get a hold of him to say, listen, you have to change, was still the aspect of him being a believer and stuck unto the Word of God. He certainly wasn't applying as an should. He certainly needed to change, but that was his hope. That was his comfort. And that's true for us. The difference now is this cleaving that he's going to run to is going to help him. He was holding on, but he still needed understanding. He was holding, holding on, but he still needed to confess sin. He was still holding, but he still needed to be removed from the way of lying. So there's almost like a paradox here with this. He knows he needs to leave the dust, the things of the world, and cleave solely to the word of God. A divided heart will get you nowhere. Because of right decisions and actions in his life, and his relationship that he did have in place to the word of God, it's what's leading to the change in him. It's what led him to see his condition. It was, it was that very fact of verse 31 that allowed him to see himself as the mirror in verse 25. Through a mirror in verse 25. And then he says he did not want to be put to shame. I think here he's praying for perseverance. He did not want to go this route and fail. He didn't want to be put to shame. He knows God will not fail. That's not even possible. He knows the way of God is right. He's convinced of that. But what he's concerned about is his own frailty. His own humanness. Also think, he admitted to living in the way of lying. He wants to stay in the way of truth. He wants protection from his own heart being deceived. He wants to know that he is living for truth. He doesn't want to find out that he has ran his life in vain, this race in vain. That he was holding forth the word of life. That he didn't live with the zeal and with the passion for something that didn't matter, out, apart from reality, apart from truth, that when he stands before God, he realizes, wait, I've wasted my time. Yeah. And shame comes in. I think both those aspects are true to this. That he didn't want to fail. He wanted to succeed. He's going to one who can help him. And then we come to the last verse, verse 32. He says, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. I will run the way of commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Here's his goal. Here's where he wants to get to. Where a soul is no longer cleaving to the dust, but he's running after God. That, that he's living in that Proverbs 2 area of, of, of recognizing how important God's word is, the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding. And he's going after it as, as silver and as gold. That there's no longer something holding him down. But he's running after his way. He's running after his commands. He's seen how precious they truly are. And that's one thing you, as, as you start reading through this and going through Psalm 119 over and over and over, you're seeing his zeal and his passion for knowing God's commands, his precepts, the statutes, the law. He sees the benefit of it. He knows the consequences here of his actions or, or the results that will come by the decisions he's making right now. He knows he's going to be running the way of God's commandments. He knows this is what will lead him to running after God. Running here speaks to his zeal, to his passion. His soul will no longer be cleaving to the dust. Listen, this is my, my desire for all of us, myself and every single one in here. Th that, that your soul is no longer cleaving to the dust, but that you're running after God. That has to be in the way of truth. Zeal without knowledge gets you nowhere. Nowhere. 
We have to see the value in God's ways and God's words if that's going to take place as well as his will for our life. And this is where he wants to be. It's Lord, whatever you want. I'm just running after you. He's not running after a position. He's not running after popularity. He's just simply running after God. Listen, this world can put so many things before us that wants to grab for that desire and get you to run after it. He has his goal in sight. He desires to run after God, after God's will, after God's commands. But he also knows in this verse that he needs still life. He needs his heart enlarged. He says, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. So what he's getting to, his goal is to get to an enlarged heart, which will lead to him running in the way of, of God's commandments. So what is he dealing with here? Again, a couple things here to point out as we go through this. The heart or our affections is key to where our feet are running. All right, Your heart or your affections are key to where your feet are running. The heart is basically our master, if you will. And that has to be right, that has to be in order, it has to be surrendered and submitted to God, who then controls it. Instead of self, instead of sin. It's then you begin to find fresh life from God. He knew if he did right, God would enlarge his heart. That's going to lead to him running after God. In other words, let's try and make this clear so we can understand what he's talking about. Try, try physically running without a heart that's in shape. Really. I, I remember I started running back in December. Um, uh, blood pressure was going up too much, you know, and then, what, about a, a year prior to that, I fell in my front yard and my shoulder was out for like six months. So was, uh, and I realized, all right, I, I got to do something here. I'm, I'm sitting behind a desk way too much. And so I, I was going to take care of that. So I started running um, uh, the first, first week of December. I still remember getting on the treadmill for the first time. Went to the Y, got on there, and oh my goodness, the first minute I thought I was going to die. I'm like, are you kidding? Keep on looking at this thing. Wow. Is this thing going to hit 300? And I just wanted to die. And then the next day, my whole body hurt. My legs trying to go upstairs. Ow, ow, ow. Um, and going through pain at times, even having to stop, pulling my calf muscle like three times and having to stop and start over. It wasn't, it wasn't very fun to run with a heart that was out of shape. What he's saying here, if I'm going to run after God, my heart had better be in shape. And he says, Lord, I know I need you to do that work in my life. What we have to do is concentrate on getting our heart in shape. Where we can run after God. God would enlarge his heart through his word and through understanding that was going to take place. God would do it for him. See, too often, our heart gets too bogged down to serve God in any meaningful, meaningful capacity. What we need is our heart enlarged. The phrase means this. Maybe I should have started off with this. But the phrase means, it's interesting, it means to make it free, free from hindrances, free from weight. I imagine all of us can think of things that are hindering our heart that are bogging it down. That's keeping it from being in a place where it can actually run after God. But he knew, he had recognized it. That's why his soul is sitting there in the dust. I mean, he's getting down to the, it's some similar words we can even use here between heart and soul. And, and he recognizes, listen, I, I, I know that when my heart is right, through all, this, all these steps that I'm taking right now, that as a result, God is going to enlarge my heart. It's going to be free from hindrances. My heart's going to be in shape. It's then I can begin to run after God. It changes your whole perspective on life. Yes, sir. It's no longer being an air traffic controller. Even though that might be what you do for the next 50 years. You realize, no, it's about running after God. It's not about that. It's about Him. But you've got to look for those things and be honest with yourself about what is hindering your heart. Again, the process is right there how to take care of it. Again, the answer is seeing your condition, seeing what is hindering your heart, falling by the craving for God to change you. The, the desire where he said in verse 25, quicken me according to thy word. I see where I'm at. 
I know there's stuff here that in my heart that, is, that has bogged it down. It has a, a ton of hindrances in it right now. And it goes through the process with the desire there that leads him to the confession of his sin. Knowing that God heard him. And desiring a true change in him going to the word of God. And then knowing well, next what I need is that comprehension. I need the understanding in my life. And then once he had the understanding, that would lead him to that change in his position. Lord, I no longer want to live in the way of lying. I am choosing the way of truth. That's the direction I want to go with my life, is the way of truth. You know what that leads to? God enlarging your heart. Freeing it up. Removing hindrances. And then you'll be able to say, I will run the way of thy commandments. See, the formula is right here, how to go from your soul cleaving to this world to running after God. Yeah. The answer is right there. It's right there. Again, but the decision is ours. We have to be in this, you know, that same place where the, where the psalmist is at and understanding the value of it, recognizing our condition, going into the, the, the craving to the confession to asking God for the comprehension to change our position from the way of lying to making the right choice for the way of truth. Listen, again, this will change your perspective of life. It will change your home. Yeah. It will change when you are battling with depression and just a, a lack of zeal in your life. It will change that. It's changing your perspective of, this, of God's word to where it isn't just simply on the knowledge level. But it's with understanding of how bad you need it. With heads bowed, eyes closed. I'll give you fellas just a minute to pray to yourself and then I'll, I'll close this in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly do love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy and grace in our life. Lord, we recognize that we do need you. Lord, it's so easy for our soul to cleave under the dust. Lord, I pray, Lord, you'd help us to see the wretchedness of that condition. Lord, that you would trouble our soul as a result of it. Or that would lead us to begin to crave and desire a quickening that comes from you that that would lead us to a point of confession of our sins, of declaring our own ways before you, and then turning to your word and asking that you'd grant us understanding so that we can choose not the way of lying, so that as we gain understanding, we see all the deceptions in our life, all the things that we've been living for that is vanity and lies that we would choose the way of truth. Knowing that through these decisions, it leads to you changing our heart to a place where we can run after you. Lord, I pray that you help each of the men with it. I pray your, your blessing, your help on their life with the struggles. And, and Lord, I pray that you would give the understanding, that you would give the grace and strength that is needed. Lord, we know we're in a battle, a battle for our families, for our children. Lord, we need to make decisions based on truth and on understanding. Our wives and our children need to see men who are running after you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us and bless our church. Lord, that you'd use us right here in Anchorage, Alaska. Again, Lord, I love you. I pray to ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. All right, you are, you are dismissed. And again, if you can stay, we are going to have a, a work day here for about three hours. Greg, does that sound about right to you? Probably about three hours. We do have some hamburgers and hot dogs here as well that we're going to be cooking up. So there will be more food. Um, and uh, uh, um, and I, I actually have an event here i got to head to here shortly, so I get to miss the work day entirely. No, no, I'll be back shortly. I will not be gone that long. And uh, um, so, but, but I will be back. Mitch? Oh, yeah, camp coins tomorrow, bring those in. Oh, also, a warning, Jerry pointed this out to me a little bit ago, he reminded me today, might as well give it out in, the, in this setting. Uh, all, all, many of us here are on social media, on Facebook, be careful of that. We had a few things pop up that he had showed me where, you know, I, I, if you go to my page, you see different things that I like. Be careful what you like, even if it's a good thing. We have, it popped up, there's a wicked event going to take place in Anchorage, was it celebrating homosexuality or promise, I don't know what it was, something wicked. And because you like the thing itself, many of your names showed up as liking that. And you know how it does it. Like, if you like this place, if you like the church, anything, you know, in Facebook, there are different events. If they promote different events that they have, it'll show which of your friends like it, even though you would never like that specific thing. So be careful with that. And the, the thing was, and I'm glad because about a year ago, I almost liked that same thing that he had showed me. It was the Anchorage Concert Association. And I've been there. I've, I've been to some of the nice classical concerts there. I've enjoyed it. Oh, I see. I see. And so, and so if you go there and you like that, then all of a sudden they have something that's pretty wicked. Guess who names pop up and all your friends' feeds is liking that? Your name does. Wow. And he showed me. I was like, oh, wow. So anyhow, be careful with it. All right? Be care Use wisdom with that. All right?